So, <clears throat> I've been thinking a lot about due process. We are being told right now that we have to behave a certain way because it's the law. When someone justifies the response of the state, you know, if 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 if, if I say, well, I don't I don't want to do X, and someone says, well, you have to, and I say, why? And they say, well, it's the law. Okay, so why does the law matter? Well, we're told the law matters because there's a system of government, there's a process, there's policies and procedures. So for the first time in my life, I watched some discussion from the West Virginia House, watched it on YouTube. Probably watched about five hours worth, and I got to see them... Uh, discuss bills and ask each other questions and kind of the, you know, parliamentary procedures. So it was a great learning experience, you know, and I would, I would highly suggest um, you go watch if you've never done that. I've never watched C-SPAN. I never cared. I think most people never cared either. So it was interesting to watch this process, and they have these very strict rules that, they have to follow, and the bills go back and forth from the House to the Senate, back and forth, and they go to committees, and then they come out, and then they're voted, and then they're passed, and then they become law. And the struggle that I'm having here is we're now being told that orders from the executive are law, but they're not law, they're orders. If you look at an organizational chart, I know this is true of the West Virginia government because I've seen it in their 2020 informational packet, that the citizens are at the top, and then there are the three branches of government, judicial, executive, legislative, and then underneath all of those are the different, um, you know, under legislative is the House and the Senate, and the committees, and under executive are all these different offices, um, and then the judicial has all the courts. And as I was taught to believe, you know, the executive was there to execute the laws that were passed by the legislative branch, because they legislate, they create law, and then the executive carries it out and enforces it, and then the judicial is there to, you know, I guess give us a place and anyone else a place to go and have a check on the executive and the legislative. So, I mean, the, you know, I mean, really, the the executive or the legislative could get together, the House and the Senate, you know, and, and they could draft a bill and vote on it and pass it that you've got to hand over your firstborn child and then the executive signs it well then we can go to the judicial and say hey this isn't right and then the judicial can act as a check on that power but that's not what we're dealing with here if you've ever been pulled over and issued a warning or a citation, you know that there's a process. There's a process, you know, when you get or you see, receive a citation, well, your car doesn't stop working and your your ability to drive a car does not end. Um, you broke the law and they say, here, ha citizen, we got you, here's a ticket. And now you have to show up in court or just pay it and say, all right, I'm guilty, I did the time, here's the fine, or you can go to the court and you can fight it. Well, now we're in this interesting territory of someone committing an infraction 
breaking and not not obeying an order from the executive and then having their business shut down because they didn't follow the follow the rule well that's not due process if it was due process let's say the you know the executive branch which the health departments fall into the executive branch so the executive branch comes in and says well you broke our rule so here's your citation okay well I'll all right fine I'll go have my day in court but that isn't what's happening you know you can have one argument on one side about the seriousness and the nature of the problem that we face that's that's one discussion and how to handle it i guess is part of the same discussion and who should handle it um but you're going to have to at least be willing if if you have a belief a foundational fundamental belief in the organization that you wish to carry out the response to the problem then i don't know why you have such a problem with people saying well wait a minute that's not how the system works so i mean the executive has no authority over me none the executive has lots of authority over the people that are under the executive there's lots of people that the executive can order around i'm not one of them the executive has no power to tell me to wear a mask the executive has no power to tell me where i can or cannot go the executive has no power to uh, or authority let me let me change that because power is one thing authority they don't have the authority okay now they can certainly round up some guys with guns and now they have power because a gun is a force multiplier if you you know i'm sitting in my truck right now you know and so let's say some random guy comes and knocks on the door and says give me all your money well, piss off. I'm not giving you my money. Then he pulls out a gun. Well, now he has power. Because he can say, well, if you don't give me all your money, I can shoot you. Okay, well, he still doesn't have authority over me, but he does have some power. And unless I have some way of presenting equal force, I guess he's going to walk off with my money. But that also makes him a criminal and a thief. I'm a little embarrassed that I'm 44 years old, born and raised inside a state, and I had never read that state's constitution. So I read it the other day, the whole thing. It's boring as hell. But informative. I had never watched the legislative process. I knew the basics. I knew what the House does. I knew what the Senate does. I, I kind of, you know, have the basic understanding of how it works. But I'd never watched it happen. And if you go watch it happen, it, it, it really kind of demystifies it because they're just people saying words. Um, I, I was, there were some people I was really impressed by. Uh, Delegate McGeehan uh, from the 1st District in West Virginia. Um, Delegate Wilson from the 60th. Uh, Delegate Bibby. Um two others that I can't think of their names, but I, I was in, you know, I was impressed by the logical uh, approach they took to their discussion of some of these bills that were, that were up. Uh, but again, they're just people. They're not magic. They, they don't have special powers. They don't have special rights. They're just, you know, they're just some people standing in a room that, you know, 
have, have some manner of authority over some things. So I feel now obviously better prepared uh, to have these discussions because I have looked into the process. And I think that's going to happen for a lot more people because a lot of people are asking questions that they otherwise not, would not have asked 60 to 90 days ago. And let's just be honest. Look, a lot of people just, they don't care what the government does. They don't care what they pass. They don't care who's president. They don't care who's governor because it really doesn't affect their life until now. And all of a sudden, people who could, which was the majority of us, by the way, People who could just kind of wander through life and maybe go vote, maybe not go vote, have the occasional water cooler conversation. Oh, I'm for this guy. Oh, I'm for that guy. Oh, I'm on this team or I'm on that team. Or I like this party or that party. But it just really didn't affect their lives until now. And now a lot of people are going, wait a minute. Uh, well, they, they, they can't do that. Well, they just did. Uh, and, the, and they did it pretty easily. Um, so we're in a situation where a lot of people, a lot more people than maybe ever, have really started kind of paying attention to this process. And I'm going to say a couple of things here that are not going to be popular. So grab your steel toe boots because I'm going to step on some toes here. Yeah, you're experiencing this for the first time, and it sucks. But there's a lot of people that have been experiencing this for a while, and a lot of y'all didn't care. There are a lot of people in prison right now for nonviolent drug offenses. And a lot of those people were poor. Some of them had straight up, you know, substance abuse issues. Um, but they're not in prison because they did something violent. They didn't break into a convenience store. They didn't, uh, they didn't assault your grandma. They, they didn't do anything that would actually constitute as a crime, which is something that actually has a victim. They just broke a law that was written by these people that we talked about and the people with the power showed up and now they're in prison and some of them for life. I mean, we, we have people in prison for life right now for drug offenses while rapists and child molesters can get out in 10 or 15 years. We will see something happen in the news like the destruction in Ferguson, Missouri, and the story of Michael Brown, who was killed by a police officer. And if you just drive by and you don't actually, you just look as you're driving by and you don't actually stop and kind of dig into it, you don't realize that Ferguson, Missouri was a powder keg because the government there, the city government, had been doing a lot of the things to those people in that small area as what the rest of us are experiencing right now. Okay? So, let's, let's play that out. So, let's say the barber, the 77-year-old barber in um, Michigan, or the... Uh, I just saw today the guy that's opened his restaurant in Defiance in um, York, Pennsylvania, or the Shelley Luther, the lady in Dallas. Um, what if a cop would have shot and killed one of them right now? What do you think the response would be? Because that's what happened in Ferguson, Missouri. This 
tyrannical behavior that we are all globally experiencing right now was happening in that small one little area in Ferguson, Missouri by a very, very corrupt local government and being enforced by the police. And then the Michael Brown thing happens and they, they shot him and killed him and, and all hell broke loose. But again, if you don't stop to look at that and understand, I didn't fully, obviously at first, when it first happened. Um, but see, here's the mistake we make. And I know you know you don't want to hear this. Well, you know, those people, you know, those, those people do stuff like that. So you can always distance yourself from it and say, oh, well, I, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't do, I would never do anything like that. Just those people would do that. See, we love to talk about natural rights, which are constitutional rights. You know, oh, my constitutional rights. Okay, but let's remember that the founding documents say, endowed by their creator. Okay, well, the, the state is not my creator. Okay, and you may you may be Christian, you may be Muslim, you may be Jewish, you may be atheist, you may be Buddhist. So, you may interpret Creator in some other way than maybe I would. But the endowment of the rights did not come from the Constitution. So you can argue on your personal philosophy and your personal belief as to where they came from, but the bottom line is they did not come from the document. The document did not create them. The document was supposed to protect them. It was a respecter of something that already existed. And so there's a lot of people, myself included, that have been looking outside the red-blue paradigm for some time now. And so we've kind of looked around, because we really haven't, haven't had our red and blue glasses on, so we've, we've been to kind of see things on the periphery. And so I can say to you that um, I have a natural right to smoke marijuana if I so choose, to drink alcohol, to have sexual relations, you know. Um, that's, a, that's a natural right because I own the body. It's, it's mine. It doesn't belong to the state and it does not belong to another human. It belongs to me. So I am the sole uh, I have the sole discretion as to what happens with this body. Now, if I were to take a, a, a use a substance like marijuana or LSD or heroin or tobacco or whatever it is or alcohol, and then irresponsibly use that body to cause harm to someone else, then that's a separate issue. Because then I have made a series of choices, and those series of choices have caused harm to someone else. Okay, but sitting inside my house, smoking a joint, doesn't harm anybody. So, there's a lot of people right now that are asking some very important questions about where rights come from and how they are... Uh, protected and enforced that are also going to have to accept that there are some things that you don't like um, that should not be prohibited by the state. You can prohibit them. You don't have to smoke marijuana or drink alcohol or have sexual relations or listen to music or watch television or certain movies or, you know, you don't, no, no one's going to force you to do that, but you do not have the right to use an organization 
as a proxy because let let's let's do this we we've seen here recently the story of the no knock raid where the SWAT team busts the door down in the middle of the night guy believes he's being invaded because that's what it was it was a home invasion with no warning um he returns fire his girlfriend or wife was killed and he goes off to prison because he shot at or shot a, a, a police officer that broke into his house in the middle of the night with no warning um, no knock warrants are a product of the war on drugs which is a failure by the way um, and and only exists to benefit pharmaceutical companies period You cannot allow that kind of behavior in what is supposed to be a free society that respects natural rights. Doesn't work. So therefore, if you are unwilling as an individual to go kick that guy's door down in the middle of the night because he may or may not, whatever it was, I don't even know. I'm assuming it was drugs. Okay, but let's say it was. If you personally are not going to go kick his door down in the middle of the night, then you do not have the right to hire a gang um, to do that for you. I am not... Let me back up. So my pastor, we've had lots of discussions over the years and he says of course everybody wants to distill you down to one thing but I mean guys I've been studying this philosophy for 10 years it's hard to put it in a little bottle okay but basically the question is um, well, well what's your big problem with government well I answered him this way I said I'm an unbeliever it's unbelief. That's the problem. See, I don't I do not have a belief system that that takes the state and turns it into a magical organization that has like supernatural powers, right? If you step back and think about it for a second. Oh, well, you know, well they passed a law, so Okay, but they wrote some words down on paper. That that's all they did. Well, they made it illegal. Okay. But it's illegal now. Whatever it is. But it whatever it is does not vanish like magic. So I do not have a belief system that takes the state and all the people involved in it and turns it into a deity that is like a superhero, like Iron Man. You know, it, it's not, it's just an organization. It's very antiquated. It's very slow to act. It's always behind. It's horribly inefficient. Um, it generally speaking screws up everything that it touches. Uh, its solutions are usually worse than the problems it's trying to solve. So, I don't have, I don't have an honor for it. Oh, oh, the state, they wrote words down on paper and passed them. And, oh, ah. I, I just, I don't have that experience anymore. And because of that, it makes me skeptical of the source of their information. Um, you know, you when you have... I mean, if it was any other organization on the planet, if it was Walmart, and Walmart was caught up in as many scandals and as many documented... Uh, I mean, uh, assassinations and scandals and just deals and, and stuff that's so immoral... 
if Walmart did that, people burn the stores down. But when the state does it, it's like, oh, well, it's okay. And generally it's because, well, my team did it. So as long as it wasn't the other team that did it, I'm okay with it. But as long as my team does it, you know. And so then we have a problem of you have Republicans giving Republican power that they wouldn't want a Democrat to have. And you have Democrats giving Democrats power that they don't want Republicans to have. But once you give it to them, they have it. And, it, you know, I thought when Trump first got elected, uh, if you remember back, what's it been now, four or five years, there was something that Obama was trying to get done. And he's like, well, I got a pen and I got a cell phone, which was to say I'm going to call everybody. And then I've got a pen. I can write an executive order and I'm going to make this happen. And I, I kind of made a joke when Trump got elected, I guess. I, well, I guess. Now Trump has the pen and the cell phone. You know, because whenever you give one a bunch of power, you are giving it to the other. Um, I made the analogy uh, with immigration. Uh, when, when people, when the media... Okay, so think about this. Just try to think about this in a linear linear fashion. So Trump comes along, and the the media hates Trump, and so he makes some immigration decisions, and the media goes and finds, you know, the detention centers, which are, are immoral, and they're horrible, and they're terrible. Oh, my God, look at these. Well, see, here's the problem. George W. Bush and Barack Obama built the car. All Trump had to do was get in it, turn the key, and step on the gas. Without the Bush and Obama administrations and everything that they did to create that system of immigration, Trump could have never done any of that. Right? But we we are taught to put walls, you know, oh, well, switch from Democrat to Republican, so we're not going to remember anything before that. And so the detention centers have been around for a long time, but the media wasn't going to talk about that while Obama was president. They weren't ever going to show you, um, you know, immigrants coming here seeking asylum to get away from God knows what, you know, stuff that we can't even fathom. And they come here to seek asylum. They're coming here to follow the basically internationally accepted procedure for asylum. And then um, they get their kids ripped away from them and sent God knows where, um, you know, because we've got a little bit of a child sex trafficking problem, in case you didn't know. And, And then the parents are are either sent off to a detention center or, or, or shipped back across the border. Okay? Counter that with a guy named Gavin Syme, S-E-I-M, who's a very outspoken liberty activist um, from the Northwest United States. had gotten, you know, gotten a lot of people's faces, made a lot of bureaucrats and people angry. And so he and his family fled to Mexico. And they went, they, they crossed the border. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. They, de, they uh, disabled the GPS and the OnStar in their van, packed up their stuff. They snuck across, the, snuck across the Mexican border. And once they were there, they went to the Mexican government and said, hey, we're here to apply for political asylum. And it took a year. So that whole year, they're living in, in, in Mexico. They have, you know, a legal status in Mexico until they eventually got political asylum from the United States. But what happens when somebody lands here on our soil? Is, is, is that how they're treated? No, that's not how they're treated. Natural rights are natural. You're born with them. Okay? I'm not born with them because I was born 
in this geographical location. I'm born with them because I was born. So back to endowed by our Creator. Okay, this one's straight for the Christians. Endowed by our Creator. The people that founded this country, that created the system of government that we now live with, said, endowed by our Creator. Okay, then who's the Creator? Jehovah God. All right? Cool. So God is the Creator. So God created the United States. No. God created the world. So if he if he endows us with rights that we're born with, then every man, woman, and child in every place on this planet has the same rights that I do. Now, they may not have a piece of paper where they're at that recognizes those rights, but that doesn't change the fact that they have them. They may have, unfortunately, grown up in a place where they don't know or understand that they have these natural rights. Well, you can't blame them if they don't know, if they've never been taught, if they've never been shown. So, there's a, there's a lot of... Um, really important conversations that need to take place right now. Where do the rights come from? What's there to support the rights? What's the due process? What, you know, but we now, we have, we have crossed over from this constitutional republic into an area where there are executives that rule by decree. Well, if you're happy about that, uh, you know, then more power to you, I guess. Um, but at some point, it will be revealed um, how many people believe that uh, that's not how it should be and that we should follow the system that was put in place 240, 240 years ago. Uh, here, you know, but it's interesting, you know, all these other countries, they have constitutions too. And that's why we're seeing um, protests spring up all over the, all over the globe right now. Um, be, because there are people other than those living and born in the United States that believe that they have natural rights, the same natural rights that we do. And so that's why you're seeing them pop up in other places. I mean, you, you literally have a United Nations like Council on Human Rights. Um, human rights are not American rights. They're human rights. They're, they apply to everybody. Uh, so we need, to, we need to start having conversations. If you're watching this, you sit down with your family members and just talk about this system of government. Please don't treat the Constitution like it's some holy document that was handed down from heaven. It's not. Okay? It's just a piece of paper. That's all it is. It, it's not supernatural. It's not living and breathing. It's, uh, But it is the foundation of the system of government that is supposed to be in place right now. So let's talk about it that way. Well, you know, the Constitution says this, the Constitution says that. Uh, look at your state constitution. Go read it. Go read the laws that's, that the governor is citing in their order. And then you can decide. I have made my decision. Um, I have looked at the data. I have looked at the guidance. I've, I've, you know, I've been all over the CDC website. I've, I've heard what they've had to say, and I have made my decision as to how I am going to behave going forward. Now, I guess one last thing I should say is, you know, I am fortunate, honored, and blessed 
that I haven't had to fight. Uh, my customers stayed open. So my income was completely unaffected through all this. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful for people that stood up to the government and said, no, we're not doing it. We're staying open. And they did. Um, and I think that's happening a whole lot more than what you would be led to believe by the news because I, I've been on the road through all of this nine or ten weeks now, and, and I've seen a 25% reduction in traffic. Um, but where they're getting us is the places where it's easiest, okay? And that's, um, you know, the doctor, the restaurant, the hair salon. And so I want to leave you with this. In his book, Liberty Defined, Dr. Ron Paul said, Tyranny always begins with the oppression of unpopular minorities. And and they can change those min- who those minorities are on a dime. And so what we're seeing now is businesses that are being put in an unbelievably stressful position to, to try to open their business and follow all these rules and guidelines. But then you have all of the thugs, the enforcement thugs that are coming in and say, oh, no, you have to do it this way. And if you don't do it that way, you know, we, but, what, but we follow the CDC. Oh, well, it's different here. You know, we've got different guidelines here. Um. You need to understand that, that people that go into business do so because they they have a passion for it and they love it and it's important to them. And they love their employees and they love their customers and they love the business itself. And so uh, what this terrorist attack has done has crushed and destroyed um, some of the most honest, hard, most hardworking people that we have among us. And so, I mean, you, you really should not be surprised if, if those people that are so passionate um, begin to revolt um, because you're, you're taking their entire life away from them. Because, you know, you, you may have a 9-to-5 job. And you may say, oh, well, you know, well, it doesn't matter. I go in at 9 and I leave at 5. Well, when you have a business, it's 24-7, 365. Um, just because the lights are out don't mean you're not working on your business thinking about it um, how to make it better how to how to make it last and um, so you're just going to have to understand that that people have been completely destroyed by this and they're going to start getting desperate and they're going to start disobeying the rules um which, by the way, again, they're not laws because they were not, they did not go through the legislative branch at any point. Um, these are these are executive decrees that do not apply to us because I don't work for the executive. The executive has no authority over me. So that's all I got for now. I'll talk to you later.